Some of you may have seen the sentencing from this case on another channel. I went through and found most of the prior hearings to try and put some details together on what happened exactly. It was a little bit confusing. I also put in a FOIA request for the police report to get some details on what the actual allegations were against him, and I was denied. I found that interesting. So, we don't really know exactly what the allegations were, just that they are, there are allegations against an employer by an employee who he had a relationship with. December 6, 2023, 9 a.m. Thank you, Judge. All right. Sorry Thank about you, last Bob. night. We'll continue. Sorry, sorry about last night. But... Hey, it happens. Yeah. I enjoyed myself. So we're no, good. It was a good day. Right. It was a good day. <laughs> Court calls the case People versus Jason Stevens. This is. Patricia Riser on behalf of the people. Good morning, Assistant Public Defender Lauren Perney on behalf of Mr. Stevens. Mr. Are you Stevens? on this case? Because we have no counsel listed, but this is a PD case. Yeah, I checked IS and we were um, assigned at arraignment. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Whatever and was I, on ours, ours did not. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, I did um, have a chance. Or Mr. Stevens, can you state your name for the record? Jason Stevens. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Your Honor, I did have a chance to speak with Mr. Stevens and Ms. Reiser. We are asking for an adjournment to um, obtain some, some other discovery, please. During the matter of November 1st, 2023, 9 a.m., bond with its conditions will continue. All right. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Court calls the case of the people versus Jason Stevens. Prosecuting attorney Morgan Barroso to ask people. And Old Sherlinka, on behalf of Mr. Stevens, who is present. Mr. Lenka, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Judge. Are you? It's been a while since I've seen you live, at least. What? It's been a while since I've seen you. In I know. I was saying, nobody told me you were here. Well, we were on the docket, so. What? Well, I, I know, but I don't read that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's good seeing you. <laughs> All right, what are we doing? Judge, we have a resolution in this case. I believe Ms. Barroso emailed the, the court the terms of the resolution. Mr. Stevens will be entering no contest plea to count one, the only count in this case, with an agreement to prosecutors deferred. I have not sworn. Brian, do you stop swearing in front of the testimony you're about to give? I hope the truth and nothing but the truth to help you go. I did. Thank you. Thank has he signed an advice or right for him? Judge, I believe he did it at arraignment. Maybe if he didn't, we can execute one now. There's not one in file. He may have. Uh, I was not present at arraignment, so I'm not. Can't. I think actually, well, he was advised of it on the record, but he did not sign. Do you want us to still execute yes. one? Yes. Okay. What is this? It's Constitutional ways you have a right to go to trial. I verbally said yes. Yeah. They just wanted for the file. All right. Thank you, sir. Sir, this is court's understanding that you are going to be pleading no contest to the charge of assault and or assault battery. It's a misdemeanor punishable by up to 93 days of jail, $500 fine plus court cost. Do you understand that, sir? Yes. Yes, right. Do you understand what a no contest plea is? Yes. All right. Let me explain two things about a no contest plea just to make sure. The first thing about a no contest plea you need to understand is it means that you're not further desirous or wanting to contest this charge. You understand that? Yes. All right. The other thing is, is that for purposes of sentencing, the court will treat you the same as though you had pled guilty. You understand that? Yes. All right. Basis for the no contest plea. Potential civil liability. All right. So, sir, to that charge, how do you plead? No contest. And you understand that by pleading no contest, you'll not have a trial of any kind. Yes. All right. You signed an advice of rights for him today, correct? Yes. Any questions regarding any of those rights? No. 
Please look at paragraph five on that form. You'll see a copy on the podium. Those are your rights which are part of a trial. You understand that by pleading guilty, you'll be giving up those rights as well as all the rights on that form. Yes. You understand you're giving up your right to appeal over it. Oh, yes. Are you on probation or parole? No, sir. Has anybody promised you anything other than what's been stated here today on the record to get you to plead? No. Anybody threaten you or coerce you? No. You're doing this voluntarily? Yes. And of your own free will? Yes. The court has been provided and has reviewed Pittsfield Township Department of Public Safety report for their case number 2314395. Any objections to the court having reviewed that report? No. Your Honor, defense will stipulate for purpose of the plea only. No. Based upon the court's review of that report, the court does find that there's a sufficient factual basis in which the court the court could determine the defendant's guilt of this offense. Counsel, have I complied with the court rule? The people are satisfied, Your Honor. Defense is satisfied also. Court will accept the defendant's plea of no contest to this charge. <laughs> defendant is referred to probation for a pre-sentence investigation and report and consideration of prosecutors deferred sentencing in this matter will be April 24th, 2024, 1 p.m. Bond with its conditions will continue. Will that date work for you? It does, Your Honor. I, I did want to address Bond because I believe there was a warrant in the file. We. Mr. Stevens was advised by Officer Lynch that there was a warrant issue to check in the system. And it yes, it like one. was. I'm so we would like to address that if we may. Get these files organized. Do we have why the warrant was issued? Yes. Yeah, March 4th. March 4th. Is there a CC violation? It doesn't say. Yeah, yeah. It's my warrant, though. Yes. Obviously. Stipulations to adjourn. Were you going to community corrections? No, Your Honor. Yeah, I believe the warrant was for alleged no contact violation, if that helps. Yeah, that may, because I do see a report in here. Go ahead and begin your addressing. I see it. Now. Your Honor, Mr. Stevens will be admitted to the violation at the time. He did make contact with Ms. Morley, who's a former employee back in January of this year. Uh, he did send her through the, the company, I guess, messaging system, uh, her 2023 pay stubs, access to 2023 pay stubs and a W-2. Uh, and he further advised her that he will, at some point, will be stopping her access to the shared cloud-based system where she has access to those documents. So that was the nature of the contact, Your Honor. That was what? That was the nature of the contact, Your Honor. All right. Any response from the people regarding that? Your Honor, I do just want to note that it's not simply just sending those documents. There is also a note attached to it that says, can't assume, won't up open, trusting you'll do the right thing, whatever that, that is, or whatever this is. It was handwritten on the envelope. From what I was told. That's not what the worst part. That was a what appeared to be a credit card in an envelope. And rather than just throw it away, we've had it forwarded to her address. And hand uh, that note was handwritten on there just because we didn't know what was in the envelope. So and it could have been a, cre a company credit card. I later went to the bank and made sure that her name was no longer on the company bank account. But it was your note. 
I, I, I seems like I probably wrote that. Yeah. What I will do is I will cancel the bench warrant in this matter. I'll reinstate previous. Um, bond with its conditions. Um, I'll take the admission to the violations. The sentencing on those violations will be taken into account on the date of his sentencing on the primary charge. So we're going to leave that one. All right. Thank you, Adam. One last thing, if I may. Just escape this one, but go ahead. This will be quick, Judge. We're requested uh, permission for, for Mr. Stevens to travel to the state of Kentucky. He's hoping to leave later tonight and come back on Friday. This is for a work permit. Okay. Kentucky, Southwestern. You know what you're going to? Hopkinsville. What date? Today through Friday. Today. 27 through 29. Allow the defendant to travel to the state of Kentucky, March 27 through 29. You a basketball fan? Not really no, I know that. Yeah. Well, if you go down there, visit the University of Kentucky, have them see if they're still licking their wounds and what the green. <laughs> All right, and tell them special greetings from Michigan. All right, thank I'll you. Right. <laughs> thank you, Judge. Good to see you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Honor. I'll be your mind on behalf of Mrs. Stevens, who's frozen. Your name, sir? Jason Stevens. Right. On behalf of probation, Your Honor, Victor was in this case present and would like to address the court. All right. You two can step back and. Hello. Hello, Judge. What's your name? My name is Kashmir Morley. All right. Very good. What would you like to tell the court? When I was 24, just barely out of college, I applied for a job as a note taker for an exhibit design company in Ann Arbor. I met Jason for the first time as an interviewer. We talked about career goals and how I was really interested in a graphic design role, though I was willing to take on other hats to get my foot in the door somewhere creative. Months later, he would hire me as just that, a graphic design contractor for his company. For two years, I did small projects for him, working my way up to be his design assistant. I was 26 at that time. For those two years, we forged what I thought was not only on creative partnership, but a friendship. I look back over that time now and see that those were two crucial years where we built my trust and my friendship as a form of predatory grooming. What did the title design assistant entail? Doing everything for this man, and I mean that quite literally. Jason would take me out to lunch one day on a long solo work trip back from Kentucky, where he and I would be sitting alone to tell me that he and his wife were in an open relationship, something I would later come, out, come to find was a lie to get in my pants. I remember feeling uncomfortable about him sharing this with me, me, his female understudy, who at the time was in an almost decade long romantic relationship of my own. I chalked his transparency up to our close friendship and didn't put much thought into it again until he started bringing this up quite frequently. If you ever wanna have some fun, let me know, he told me one day, I think you and I would be amazing together. I was again, 26, and my long high school sweetheart relationship was falling apart, though no one knew, including Jason. Jason was 47 at this time and married with a child. Eventually, upon his probing, I would share with him that I was fresh out of leaving a long-term significant other. At this point, I was only two years out of college. My career was just starting to form. I was in a position of fragility in my life, and he knew that. I told him I didn't think it was a good idea. I told him that crossing that boundary would ruin our work relationship. He said to me words that would come back to haunt me. In September of 2023, you'll always have your job no matter what. The what became years and years of sexual abuse emotional abuse, physical abuse, abuse of power. The what became me telling him no and it happening anyway. 
I noticed that Jason began taking away work tasks for me whenever I wouldn't sleep with him. Every day I came into the office to do my job and said became a game of mental gymnastics for me. Is he going to tell me I'm fired again today for no reason at all? Will he tell me I'm no longer working on this project for no reason that he can give me? The abuse was constant. If it wasn't emotional, it was physical. It took me four years of abuse to realize that there was an end to that sentence that he never spoke out loud. You'll always have your job no matter what, unless you tell anyone what I'm doing to you. I sat in my office the day he assaulted me, staring at my phone where I had typed 911. My finger hovered over that call button for what must have been 10 or 15 minutes. If I called, I knew my job was over. I knew I'd wake up the next day unemployed. I knew he would fire me for telling someone about his inability to keep his hands to himself. But the alternative was to keep letting him hurt me, and I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take one more day of the abuse. I would lose a month worth of wages after making that call. I would spend thousands in therapy trying to make sense of what he had done. I would worry about paying rent. I would worry about feeding myself, about keeping a roof over my head. And then I would be begin to worry that he would harm me further. In October, after the 911 call and Jason's arrest, he began to threaten me. He left a handwritten threat in my mailbox telling me to do the right thing in the middle of an impending trial. And I do say leaves because there was no forwarding address on that letter. Someone had to come drop it off at my house. And can you guess who was the only person at work who knew where I lived? When I didn't do exactly what Jason said, he started to show up at my house unannounced. He drove by my home and parked in front of my apartment dozens of times in an effort to make me feel unsafe, to make me feel like I had no other choice but to drop the charges against him if I wanted this to stop. Do you see a pattern? Jason has a back entrance from his house to his rental apartment, meaning he would not have to see me or be near my house at all if he wanted to check on his rental unit. Yet I continue to see him drive and park down my street. Any way imaginable that he could try to make me feel afraid is what I've had to live through and deal with since I called the police. When I didn't drop the charges, he started emailing me when there was a no contact order. And in every email, there was a threat. And every threat was sent from a fake name from an email he and I set up for the sole purpose of setting up technology on the work site. I know this because I worked for him for six years. If Jason had actually wanted to message me something pertaining to work, he could have emailed me from his Jason at handle as he had done for the past six years. But instead, he sends me back intellectual property that he stole from me from a fake name, minus anything I worked on for him, leaving me bereft for my own portfolio moving forward, and then tells me, I hope you got what you needed and we're in the clear weeks before we're about to appear in court together. Jason J. Stevens, I am not afraid of you. Your threats do not work. It took me six months of intensive therapy to realize how badly he was abusing me. I entered the relationship with him consensually, but the abuse I endured was not consensual. The most disheartening part of this whole ordeal is being an up-and-coming young woman in a predominantly male profession and experiencing betrayal, mistrust, and abuse by someone I considered a mentor and with whom I looked up to. Jason could have made a difference in this world for not only young women like me, but young women like his daughter by holding his company to a higher standard than the one he created. And yet I am standing here today to hold him accountable for the actions he has done because he has chosen to do the opposite. I suggest battery intervention for Jason's probation. Jason chose to create a toxic workplace that is unsafe for any woman who steps foot on his job site. He created a world where women fail the moment they come to work. And if I have anything to say about that, that stops today. I just want to clarify something. Thank you for that. Um, are you indicating that... I think I'm aware of some of them, but that there was contact or alleged contact while this matter was. Yes. At what points? Because every month as I was listening, as I was listening to you, I don't, I don't think I have all of that, and I don't know that that's been taken into account with sentencing. Before you answer, Miss Valera. I, yes, I don't have anything, Judge. So I'm. I don't. Yeah. Your Honor, oh. we did raise the issue of the note on the document which was delivered by the defendant at the trial date, but the additional information, the additional context, we did not know. Okay. I had a so that's what I'm a touch bit concerned about, that I don't have everything in front of me. Um, I realize what you said in terms of where they were sent from, how you recognize them, whatever, but mm -hmm. you still have those? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a whole FOIA document that I had forwarded, I think, to Christine at one point. Okay. So, um, all right. 
I, I think I want those. Okay. To, I want certainly Miss Polera to have those. I can certainly give those to you. Um, the other. thing that I'm wondering, and, and it kind of gets beyond the court's province, I think. You, you, don't have, this is, you don't have this. Um, as, as I'm, I understand that there was a work relationship, but there was also an intimate relationship at some point. Were we aware of that? Because here, here's my concern, um, particularly given what's been requested. As I'm reading the recommendation from probation, I I would think that this would need to more look like or should look like a DV sentencing as opposed to um what it's charged as an assault and battery something i don't i'm not saying go back and try to charge them i'm not saying any of that i'm just saying in terms of the structure of the sentence given at least what i'm hearing here i think that that may need to be examined particularly in terms of and your honor i, I also know that miss morley is asking for restitution um, in the recommendation for probation, I was asking for a restitution hearing to be set. Given light um, of her statement to the court um, and probation being unaware of continued contacts and her indicating that she has proof of those, probation would ask that the sentencing be adjourned where, we, where I can reevaluate and look at everything um, to provide this recommendation um, for sentence as well as maybe address restitution all in one yeah, well and that's what I was I was going to do that mainly because of the initial thing that was said regarding the contact because I don't have that um, and can't take that into account I guess the other And I realize at this point, it's in essence an allegation. The the contact has occurred how often? It's every month since he was arrested. So between October and um, March, I would say. I think that was in January. Yeah. So there was contact in March? Yes. For the very end of February to March. I can't remember the exact date, but it would have been like the last week of February, March. Hey, ma'am, let me... Just ask you when these when this contact would occur, what did you do with that? Um, I sent it to the um, cop who was dealing with all of this originally. Pardon? I sent it to the cop who was handling this case originally, or I called um, you know, 911. So it's all documented. Oh well that I, I get that, but I'm so you get any notice from the officer in charge of this case whatsoever about any violations that were sent to them by the victim. He had a separate um oh what is the word? Um I'm blanking on the word for his arrest in March because of the stalking and harassment. A um oh not complaint. He had a warrant out for his arrest in March because of all of the stalking and harassment. <laughs> okay, hold on. There's a warrant. You said there was a warrant out for him? Mm -hmm. Out of where? 14A, District Court. 
anything? Bench one issue March 4th, but I don't see why. March 4th on, on this case? On this case. I issued the warrant for failure to comply with bond conditions. Is that still active? It, no, I show it's canceled. It was canceled March 27. When he came back, and that was part of the violations that he admitted to yeah. that I'm taking into account in sentencing. So I get that one. But that's all I see. That's all you see in our system. So, ma'am, you're of the understanding that there was a warrant of a new charge? No, that's the same one that I'm thinking of. Okay, <laughs> that that came out of this. Yes. Got it. Yep. Okay. So, but... So, all of what you relayed to me today in terms of these contacts... Those were sent to Pittsfield Township Department of Public Safety? Yes. Okay. Or Ann Arbor as well, because I live in Ann Arbor, and so there was like a jurisdiction issue, and the cops said that he couldn't handle anything that was not in Pittsfield. So when he sent, dropped the letter off at my house, that was Ann Arbor. So maybe okay. that's the issue, too. So, so some of this is in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Some of it's in Pittsfield. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. All right. And the prosecutor doesn't. Okay. So we'll have to round that all up. Ms. Yermolenko, is there anything you wanted to say regarding the request for an adjournment regarding the. I don't have We're not going to have additional contact allegations. We're aware of the. We're going to do a 2D now contact. I'm going to say January. That's what the foreign bond violation was for. We addressed it at the last Correct. It was set aside. Um, all those additional allegations I've never heard of previously, and I would like to see those police reports. So I can leave the case. Okay. And I do also want to note for the record, I just ran through my email. I did not get anything directly from Ann Arbor or Pittsfield with regard to a bond violation. We did receive an email from Ms. Morley, regarding the FOIA, that she, the information she received from the FOIA, I also just checked our internal file system, and the only case for Mr. Stevens, which shows all of the warrants that have been submitted as well, is this case. There is nothing. There's nothing. Okay. Office. So there all has right. not been an additional warrant request from Ann Arbor or from Pittsfield with regard to this case. Got it. Or from, I should say. Hey, I spoke to the Pittsfield officer myself when we found out about the warrant. You did not mention any additional context, but once again, that's, we were not aware of the additional context that the interruption. Okay, right. Got it. Okay, and so that I'm also aware, and the the claim for restitution is for. Right, she's asking, yeah, she's asking for um, to cover therapy. Got it. She did provide some um, receipts. We're just taking a look at those today. Um, I, I don't think that I have everything. I think that she may be looking um, for additional. Got it. Okay, so May is probably not is going to be too soon. Or, I mean, it's not too soon for me. I want everybody to be able to do the work. That's so. That's my concern. And Ms. Yermolenka has risen, and she probably I isn't available. Oh, of course not. But I have another call the week fifteenth. Well, no, we don't do. Is that going to be enough time? Twenty second. What about the twenty second? 
Your work? Okay, ma'am. So what I'm going to do is I will adjourn this to May 22nd, 2024 at 9 a.m. Um, I'm so sorry, I thought it was going to be in the hour. Whoa. Now you're throwing things? Okay, yeah. You thought it was going to be in the afternoon. I, I did. I am scheduled to be in the one place this report all morning. That morning. No way. I'm available in the afternoon. Um, is it? Is that one in the morning? It is. It is. Uh, I, but I will. I, I will. also be gone that day. Is it possible? <laughs> Heck, I'm going to get out of town, too. So we'd have to go to the next. June 12th. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. June twelfth work for everybody. Ten a.m. work. I have a thing in front of the bar at nine. He'll wait. <laughs> no. Okay. No. Go there. Let us know. Well, of course, you're you're just right up to. Yeah, that last famous last word. June twelfth, two thousand twenty-four at nine a.m. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Court does call the case of the people versus Jason Stevens. The recall, I guess, technically. We'll be wanting to have Mr. Hughes. I don't know. Does the court need us at the podium? I didn't know. No, that, that's fine. As long as you're talking. It, it picks up very well on that side from where you are. So. I'll speak up if I need to. Oh, thank you. Sure, Lord, your Malinka said I'll speak up if I have to. Don't we know it? <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, sometimes, <laughs> and other times, not so much. <laughs> Yeah. Just, I, I can just put on the record that we got over the pre-sentence report. I don't have any factual corrections to make to the body of the report. All right. I just have some comments regarding the recommendation. Yes. And I believe we are in agreement that there should be a restitution hearing set as a result. All right. Can we approach? I said no. Would it work now? Go ahead. Certainly, some I'm going to be vague in certain respects about this, but certainly some information and other things have come to the court's attention today. I've had probably amounts to two hours total probably or near two hours of conversation with counsel regarding those things it is from this court standpoint for the court to make fair just decision it is not something that i think i can do today and so i'm not going to rush forward to do that there is also the issue and, and that's strictly regarding the sentencing aspect potential incarceration aspect of any sentence and the bond violations. And I want to be clear before I do what I'm going to do. So that's one thing. The other thing out of this is that there is then a issue of restitution, which would require us to come back for an additional day in any event. So what I'm going to do and what I've suggested to counsel, and I understand there may be some objection, but I think we're all in agreement, is I'm going to set the sentencing and the restitution hearing on one day. And that's going to be on a Monday, July 8th yes. at 9 a.m. All right. So that counts as aware. Oh, no, Monday I'll have my courtroom. 
So we'll be here. All right. That'll be at 9 a.m. that Monday, July 8th, that we will have that plus the restitution hearing. To the extent there are documents that the parties want the court to consider that are not in response to some other documents that were given. I'm going to put it that way. Those must be in the hands of the attorneys, the respective attorney's offices, prior to the end of this month. So prior to June 30th, any documents that the parties want considered by the other side, the, the idea in this is, is that if there are documents that come forth to one side, the other side can then look talk to the necessary parties so that they can be, give a response. It is not necessary, I don't think, for the court to have those. I will certainly see them hear argument regarding anything like that during the hearing. So don't worry about getting them to me. It's more I want the exchange to happen. Okay. Everybody understand that? Yes. Is there anything else from either side? Nothing from the side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Okay, have a good day. 14A stands so adjourned. Thank you, District Court, for coming to Washington State of Michigan to final session. All those the court's are on there. The Honorable Judge J. Cedric Simpson preside. You may be seated. Court does call the case of the people of the State of Michigan versus Stevens. Assistant Prosecuting Attorney Morgan Barroso, on behalf of the people. Hey, and only your mind can be happy, Mr. Stevens. Just for All right. Date and time set for a restitution here, sentencing and a restitution here. That is correct. Parties ready to proceed? We are, I already know where you want to start. Well, after the holiday, really didn't want to start at all, but I'm here. <laughs> where, what are you suggesting? Well, Judge, I think with this, I guess I'll. You let me pick, I'll go with the sentencing. I believe we previously indicated that we've reviewed the recommendation. Uh, there's no correction that needs to be made to the report. We just have, obviously, the restitution was one one issue. That's why we have a hearing on it. And also, we recommended three days of jail time for the for the bond violations. So, I mean, that's another point we wanted to address. Okay, the bond violations, right. Um, well, why don't we start with the restitution hearing? Let's get that out of the way. You can try to formulate something um, that encompasses a whole sentence. And counsel, there was one issue that came up and received that. And I think copies were sent to the parties because the court had reviewed it. Um, There, well, and I know a copy was sent to counsel, so. All right, why don't we start with that? Are the people ready to proceed with the restitution here? Yes, Your Honor. All right, you may proceed and call witnesses if you want. Uh, the people will call Cashmere Morley. Come forward and meet one. <clears throat> You may inquire. Thank 
So I know, Ms. Morley, you submitted a request today for lost wages as well as reimbursement for therapy costs. Um, so we've already had a conversation about just proceeding forward with the request on for therapy costs and not lost wages. So we're going to just talk about therapy costs today. Um, as far as that goes, it's my understanding that you've received two types of therapy. Is that correct? That's correct. Can you tell me what those two types of therapy are? The first type is more of a traditional type of therapy, I guess you would say. And the second type is somatic craniosacral therapy. Um, when you say traditional type of therapy, are you saying like psychotherapy? Yes. Okay. And can you tell me who you see for that? I see Wendy Blinsky for that. Okay. Wendy. Nobody get a spelling for the record. K-L-I-N-S-K-I. -I. Okay, thank you. Um, do you know about how much you're requesting for psychotherapy specifically today? Um, I believe it was close to three grand. Maybe a for just psychotherapy? Oh, I don't know. Between the two. Okay, so if I told you... 145904. Does that sound right? Okay. Um, can you tell me, does insurance cover those appointments for you? It does. Has it always covered those appointments for you in total? Not in total. I do pay some out of pocket. Okay. So has your out of out of pocket cost for those changed over time? Um when Immediately following this incident, can you tell me about how long it was before you had your first psychotherapy appointment? Um, after September 22nd, I had a therapy appointment. I think it was a couple of days after. It was on, over the weekend. Okay. And was it on, have you had appointments ongoing since then or did you stop? Ongoing. Okay. And do you know about how many appointments you've had? Um. I've gone at least once a week since September second. If I said twenty-two appointments, okay. And so, do you happen to know about how much you were billed for those initial appointments? Um, initially, it was around like one hundred forty-seven out of pocket, and then my insurance changed, and I paid like one out of pocket. Okay. If you saw an invoice for or invoices for your individual therapy appointments today, would you recognize them? Yes. Did her did her did your insurance change at some point? Yes. You obtained insurance? I had insurance the whole time. Just um, the new year I got insurance. I'll see the bill and maybe have questions. Go ahead. May I approach you on it? You may. Please let the record of what's in the charging witness to people who close the exhibit number one. I know I just handed you a stack of papers. It should be 22 pages because there's 22 appointments. Um, as far as the first page, do you recognize it? Yes. Is that a fair and accurate representation of the invoice for your September 24th, is it? Yes. Okay. Um, looking at that, can you tell me the exact amount that you paid out of pocket for that first visit? Okay. And Flipping through, is that the same amount that you paid until the end of 2023 for each visit? Probably, let's see, yes. For the psychotherapy, which should be the only invoices in that. So I believe that those are eight appointments between September and the end of December in 2023. So eight appointments at $147.38. Okay. And then you said you got 
new insurance. What was your insurance previously? Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And was it an insurance adjustment or an in, or did it cover part of the appointment before? Yeah. Okay. But you still had an out of pocket expense of one hundred forty seven dollars. Okay. And then starting in 2024, your out-of-pocket expense per appointment went down. Is that correct? correct? Okay. And so you had fourteen appointments at that lower out-of-pocket expense. Is that correct? That's fair. And so those can you tell me what date? you started having that newer rate what was the first appointment you had in 2024 the newer rate began in january 1st and the first appointment i had was on the 15th of january okay and so you continued your appointments at that regular frequency <laughs> and i think the most recent appointment uh invoice we have in there is from may 22nd is that correct that's correct okay so can you tell me a little bit oh first how much out of pocket were each of those appointments? Twenty dollars each. Okay, so fourteen appointments at twenty dollars each. And what was the new insurance? Uh, priority health. Priority health. So, talking a little bit about psychotherapy, can you tell me just kind of what that modality is like as far as therapy? Yeah. Um I originally started going to that particular kind of therapy before this event even started because of the toxic workplace that I was working in that Jason and I created. And um, after this event, I started going at least once a week. And that was really what we kind of realized that this person that I had looked up to and thought was a mentor was actually very manipulative and abusive. But so when I'm asking about modality, I mean, is it a movement therapy? Is it a talk therapy? Something? Like, okay. Is it one on one? Yes. Is it in person? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, what makes these appointments after the incident with the defendant in September different from the appointments before, if anything? Before, um, I was just hoping that I could go to therapy for generalized anxiety around going to this workplace, hoping that therapy would help. After the event, it was more centered on um, how many terms of the fact that this guy that I admired and looked up to was abusive and trying to work through how it got to that point and just trying to understand how I had worked for somebody like that for so long. Hold on. Hold on a moment. So you were seeing the same therapist prior to September 22nd? That's right. For how long? Um, that's it. Um, I can't remember. I think her letter specifies. I was just about to. Okay, go ahead. Um, has your therapist, Wendy Klinsky, written a letter explaining her treatment related to this incident for you? If you saw that today, would you recognize it? Uh, Your Honor, may I approach? May. Please let the record reflect that the people are approaching with people proposed exhibit number two. I just handed you a two-page document. Do you recognize it? What is it? This is the letter that I have. Uh, is that a fair and accurate representation of that letter? Yes. Can What's you your date on that letter? Can you tell me, um, is there a specific link between those post-September 22nd appointments and the defendant's actions on September 22nd? Yeah, I would say, I mean, every single therapy appointment that I've been to since this happened has been about this. And what way? 
um, trying to heal from the trauma of it and understand how I expressed in the first place. Okay, turning to the second kind of therapy you mentioned at the start, what is that? That is craniosacral therapy, which I did online. Um, Please. Sorry to jump in, but this got a little complicated and it was too much to put on the screen. I tried. It would have taken like the rest of the video to explain this. Craniosacral therapy known as CST, it's like an alternative medicine, homeopathic. I, I'm not really sure exactly what the proper term is for it. It uses gentle touch to feel non-existent rhythmic movements of the skull's bones and supposedly adjust the immovable joints of the skull to achieve a therapeutic result. CST is a pseudoscience and its practice has been characterized as quackery, according to Wikipedia. It is based on the fundamental misconceptions about the anatomy and the physiology of the human skull and is promoted as a cure-all for a variety of health conditions. It was invented in 1970s by John Upledger as an offshoot of cranial osteopathy. I tried to find something other than Wikipedia to back this up, and there were several random studies done throughout the years on whether this works or not, but they were really small studies that I could find. Then, Whopper, 2024, massive study. And it's, is cranial therapy effective, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So they said the objective, the aim of the study was to evaluate the clinical effectiveness of craniosacral therapy in the management of any conditions. This article defines it a little more technically, and it says it's the intervention based on gentle touch that allegedly releases restrictions in any tissue influencing the craniosacral system. It has been considered as complementary and alternative medicine by the World Health Organization. So, interesting. So it's frequently used with people with chronic pain, which is why it kind of piqued my interest. I'm like, oh, hey, a lot of us have that. Conclusion was that CST fails to show to be clinically effective for muscular, skeletal, or non-muscular skeletal. Basically, it does nothing, nothing. And then it says that there were some statistical benefits in children, but they believe those two studies were skewed in the beginning. So pretty much it's quackery. Quackery might be my new word. After um, the event happened, I would say around October time, I was experiencing um, some PTSD. And my friend who knows therapist suggested that I go see this craniosacral therapist for my PTSD because it was getting so bad where I couldn't even eat or sleep or accept like a hug from a much like dissolve into panic attacks. And so I started seeing them um, to be able to touch the trauma of the event and relive the event without dissolving into panic attacks every day. Okay. So, so you have psychotherapy, which is talk therapy. What is, what type of activities do you engage in in this second type of therapy? I would say the initial part of the session is talk therapy, and then we go into um, more of the craniosacral part of it, which is lying flat and um, kind of envisioning the trauma and going to the event without, um, and being able to touch it, I guess, without um, dissolving into panic attacks. And you said you did it online? Yes. How does that work? Um, the two therapists and I start off with um, a conversation and just kind of talk about like where I'm at, how I'm feeling and everything like that. And then we go into, um, I like lay down in you know, my room or wherever I feel comfortable. And they kind of guide me through kind of like a meditation. And um, we slowly work through um, the trauma surrounding the event, the trauma that I have after the fact of daily trauma, kind of just talking about like how to kind of access that part of my brain and myself. So it kind of helps me alleviate the stress and trauma, both physically and mentally in a way that the talk therapy wasn't addressing. So I have that you started craniosacral sessions in February. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so you've only had seven sessions. Is that correct? Yeah, that's all the most recent being in June. And 
as far as those seven sessions, um, did you have any insurance coverage for those sessions? Can you tell me how much your out of pocket expense was? Okay. If you saw an invoice for those sessions today, would you recognize it? May I approach? You may. Please let the record reflect that I'm approaching the witness with people's proposed exhibit number three. I just handed you a document that should have seven pages in it. Showing a page for each of the seven sessions. Is that correct? Um, can you tell me, is that, is that a fair and accurate representation of the invoices that you've seen for those seven sessions? Um, Your Honor, the people move to admit people's proposed exhibit number three. Any objection or what there? I didn't admit. admit the previous ones, did I? You did not. Your Honor, the people move to admit people's proposed exhibits one and two. No Thank you. Exhibits one, two, and three, for the record, are admitted. Thank you. Clearly under caffeinated. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell me a little bit about how have have these craniosacral sessions helped at all with your PTSD? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I will say that I thought it was all woo-woo, just BS kind of therapy. And that's why I waited so long to try it. But I think that this has been one of the most helpful modalities of therapy I've had in terms of trying to deal with this. And so as far as the invoices go, I noticed that her address is in North Carolina. Do you happen to know, does she have a license or a certificate or? Yeah, she was originally living in Ann Arbor. So she started out here and um, she is licensed to do this kind of thing. And what kind of license do you need to do this kind of thing? Do you happen to know? I, okay. How, how do we know that she's licensed and through whom? Do you know whom, through whom she's licensed? I don't. I mean, I can find that out, but I don't know. Well, okay, go ahead. How did you find, I think you said it was two therapists. How did you find them? Your friend. That made them from Ann Arbor. Okay. Um, did you receive a letter outlining your sessions with them and the link to the incident between you and the defendant on September 22nd? If you saw that letter today, would you recognize it? What's the date of that letter? May 3rd. And the other one was May what? Okay. May I approach? May. The people, move, or, people are approaching the witness. The people are posting to exhibit number four. I just handed you a two-page document. Can you tell me what it is? This is a letter from my um, radio stable therapist. And can you tell me what her name is? Michelle. Okay. And is that a fair and accurate representation of the letter that she wrote related to this incident yes. dated May 3rd? Yes. Your Honor, the people move to admit people pro people's proposed exhibit number four. No, exhibit four is admitted. One moment, Your Honor. So just to be clear, in total for the craniosacral sessions, because it's seven appointments at $90 each, that's a request for $630 for those appointments. And then we previously said $14.5904 for the psychotherapy appointments. Is that correct? So you're asking for a total of $2,089.04 today? Okay. Nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Allen, can you hand me another exhibit? Cross examination. 
I just have a few questions for you just to clarify a couple of things. It should not take very long. I kind of specifically wanted to ask you about the cardiosacral therapy. So this Michelle Tupko, the, the woman that wrote the letter, is so it's somebody that your friend recommended, correct? Okay. And you didn't go to your insurance company to see if that's something that could be covered by insurance? Yeah, she doesn't accept insurance. She does not accept insurance. Okay, and did you did you look for her through your insurance? Like my insurance lets me go on the website and search for professionals yes. to see. Okay, did you find her in the list? Okay. This um, and so this is these are virtual sessions, correct? Yes. So you just you understand that Miss Tupo lives in a different state, right? Yes. North Carolina, is that right? Okay. Do you know if she has an office? She does. Well, have you have you seen it? Have you been there? I've not been there, but I've been up during our virtual sessions. I see it. Okay, and and you said there was a partner also. Do you know if their business has a website? Uh, they are actually making a website right now. Okay, so no website. website. They're making a website as we speak. Because when I was looking for the the way of wild remembrance healing therapies, I was not able to find anything online. So that's why I was curious as to, as to do, so no website to your knowledge, correct? Okay, and, and so you said it is your understanding that Mr. is licensed, right? But you were not able to find her insurance, correct? Okay, did you verify her license in any way? Uh, I have not, and the modality to do that, so I don't verify licenses, so no, I didn't. Okay, so you just assumed she was licensed? I took her out of word that she's licensed. Yes. Okay, but you've never seen any confirmation, never looked into it yourself, correct? Right? Where where would you look her up online? Google her name. You can see that she's well, I did Google her name and I only I only found uh, a LinkedIn profile. Are you familiar with it? LinkedIn? Okay. And I found I mean there's no picture of an individual, but it, it the only person with that name, it says Ann Arbor. Um, is a Thai massage therapist. Well, is a what? Thai massage. Got it. Oh, you looked her up on Google. Okay, but you said there's so there's no website though, right? Right. Yes. How do you know they're making one right now? Yes, we discussed it. I'm a web designer. On what? We've discussed it. I'm about to Um, Were you aware that there's, this is something that I learned uh, as pre pre while I was preparing for this hearing, that there's the Biodynamic Cardiosacral Therapy Association of North America? Um, no, that's not aware of that. Okay, well, and so there's a website that lets you uh, look for practitioners who are licensed specifically to perform biodynamic cardiosacral therapy. And I was not able to find Ms. Tupco in Michigan or North Carolina or really anywhere through that website. Is that surprising to you? No, just not with her. No. Okay. Well, we may have to get that person up here to testify because I don't. Do you know why they're. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Malenka, but I just got to get some things clarified here. Did you read this letter of May 3rd? Did you request this letter from them? Yes, I did. And because I'm looking at Exhibit 4. They don't have letterhead? No, they don't. They're not very web based people. A letterhead doesn't take web. I mean, I, I that just. Takes design. That's not something they're good at doing. And that's why well, you know a lot about these people, but why don't you just answer my question? Well, my question. Ms. Yerman, could go ahead, because apparently I'm not going to get an answer. Go ahead. All right, and just to clarify, I believe you, you took... You know what? 
you testified that you started this craniosacral therapy in February, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so you didn't increase your sessions with your psychotherapist, you just started doing a different type of therapy on your own. Okay, but you were not referred to them through a, your current therapist, correct? Okay. Well, with your um, psychotherapist letter indicated that you started therapy with them in June of 2020, correct? So you sought out that months prior to the, to the events of September 22nd, correct? Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Go ahead. How are these bills to the way of wild remembrance paid? PayPal. You have the PayPal receipts? Um, not on me now. You should be able to download them now. And send them to the prosecutor. I want to see that these were paid. And I'm still curious. Let's back up. The Great Lakes Psychology Group. You actually go in there. Okay. You were seeing them before. The, the date of this incident, right? Before September 22nd. How did you... Well, initially, these were paid with a Discover card? They continued to be paid with a Discover card? You said you switched insurance in January? Yes. How long sessions with Great Lakes? Oh, and who was this individual that referred you to Way Wild? Remember it? Uh, one of my friends who had done support. Who was that? Who was my friend? That's my question. Susan Ulrich. Name. Ulrich. Spell it. So, uh, I met her through children. Do you know if she has a connection to Way of World Remembrance? She does not have a connection. No. Pardon? Other than knowing the therapist, she does not have any connection. Did she say how she knows the therapist? She had some work done from them when they lived in Ann Arbor. Some what? Some work done from them when they lived in Ann Arbor. Some therapy sessions with them. Conversation you had about them being licensed. Did they say who they were licensed through? They did, but I don't remember that. The first talks that we had during our first conversation. Okay. Did they say they were licensed through a state and our commonwealth? Any of the 50? Prior? Pardon? I said I'm sure they did, but I can't remember. That was not the focus of our meetings. So did they say they were licensed to Michigan? Okay. Oh, Laura. Okay. You may have missed for that individual. Do the individuals at Great Lakes know that you're seeing the individuals at 
um, remembrance, whatever it was. Like. Is there a reason? Are, are these, I'll call them therapists, but I don't know what else to call them at this point, but. Are the therapists at Wild Remembrance in consultation in any way with the people at Great Lakes or vice versa? No, not to my knowledge. Have records, to your knowledge, been sent, or have you authorized records to be sent from Great Lakes to Wild Remembrance and or vice versa? No. Have they given a prognosis or to you as to how long they believe this therapy will need to be continued? I should say, has Great Lakes done that? Um, the last time that we spoke, she was hopeful that we could begin to wind it down in the next couple months. And the folks at uh, Wild Remembrance, did they? That was the same prognosis. So ending sometime when you, the last time you spoke with them was when? Uh, the end of June. And so we're hopeful for both parties to wrap up, hopefully by the end of the summertime. See anything? <laughs> Either under Michelle or the way of life. Who's the other individual that you see with wild remembrance? Oh, her partner. His name is Kalaya. Kalaya. K I L A Y A. Last name Harris, spelled how you would expect. K K I. L A Y A, and the last name is Harris. Harris. H E R R. No, Harris. H A. -R -R. Harris. Okay, I'm sorry. Well. Need to look that one up too. Right. Um, do you know whether or not this well remembrance has a tax ID, anything along those lines? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to call her if you want to answer these questions, but I don't know myself. Somehow or another, I need to download the payment records if there are if they exist for that. Like I said, I there shouldn't be a reason she can't get them right now. Um, I, Council, I am a little bit worried about who these people in North Carolina are because I don't know. I don't. I don't know whether it's a licensed therapy or anything along those lines. You said your insurance rejected paying for them. What was the insurance basis for rejecting payment? Out of network. Pardon? Out of network. That was their sole reason? Yes. Yeah. It's part of my other concern, Council, so you can be aware. And I'm going to take a break because I'm going to try to do some digging on this a little bit because, anyway, is unlike with it was set up back okay. Okay. Um, 
One thing, I mean, I I will let you know that I'm a little bit questioning the way of wild remembrance as and there may be a valid reason for it, but I don't have letterhead, which would seem unusual of drafting a letter. But also, I noticed that only one of the therapists signed this letter of May 3rd. And I'm worried about the credentials of this individual only because I don't, I typically, when we see these in this therapy, not that there has to be, I usually have some letters after their name denoting some type of degree or some type of something. And I have, I have nothing on this letter uh, at all. And I don't, well, I have nothing on the letter and I am not finding them anywhere. I also can see the payment. It looks like payment records from Great Lakes, but I don't see payment. I'm going to need that if I were to even consider awarding it the payment records to the other place. I want to clarify one thing. Ma'am, you... You testified here that they don't accept insurance. So if they don't accept insurance, why do you submit it to your insurance? Just to see if they would be covered. I know that um, another doctor is out of network. Well, hold on a second. To see if they would cover what? Anything out of network. Sometimes my insurance does. But they had already told you they don't accept it? Right. But I figured I would try it just because it was so expensive. Okay. So they told you they don't accept insurance. You're telling me you submitted it to your insurance after that. Yes. Okay, I'll ask, what would be the purpose of that? Sometimes my insurance covers things that are out of network from out of network providers, even if it's a small amount. So I thought I would try to see if they would cover any of it. Did they indicate to you and they being way of wild wilderness individuals. Did they indicate to you why they don't accept insurance? They did not. Take a recess. I want to see the the one thing I want to see is I want to see these receipts from PayPal. I, I need to see them. What's going to stand in recess? All right. Versus Jason Stevens. <clears throat> Assistant Prosecuting Attorney Morgan Barroso on behalf of the people. And Olga Yermolek on behalf of Mr. Stevens, who is present. Did you want us at the podium or? No, you can. No, we'll wait for Ms. Perry. Very sorry. Got all your stuff. Okay. <laughs> all right, real good. <laughs> And I guess I should say good afternoon, Ms. Perrini. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, there are no additional witnesses? No, Your Honor. Any witnesses for the defense? No, Your Honor. All right. Argument. Your Honor, the people rest in the police. Mr. Do you want to work out a lengthy discussion uh, off the record regarding this matter? I think, I believe the court understands where our position is. And let me just say that the the reason that the so that the record is clear that the court called counsel and probation back is because uh, 
I had received a communication from a Tanya Desfantes um, regarding the, I guess, credentials of Ms. Tuco. And I, upon receiving it, it was received in my office. I didn't quite know what to make of it. So I called counsel back to deal with what the court was supposed to do with that issue. Um, the sum and substance of that is talking about, and I guess I'll begin there, it's just kind of the reverse of the order of proofs. But the sum and substance of that is that um, there is some accreditation, some licensure, something that makes what uh, Ms. Tuco does, uh, I don't want to use the word legitimate, but some type of therapy that the court should consider in this case. Um, there are a few problems that I have um, with entering into that, uh, not necessarily analysis but coming to that conclusion um, I along with my staff searched all over to find something regarding Ms. Tuco the credentials to, to tie the therapy testified to into um therapy that could be related to the events in this case. Um, the only thing that we were to find or could find regarding Ms. Tuco directly was a LinkedIn page. And I'm not saying that it is going to list everything. However, in terms of the education and cre credentials of Ms. Tuco, um seems that it was the Chicago School of Thai Massage. Um, talks about her being faculty um, and co-founder of Human Feeling, which is, I guess, an organization or some type of company, but it's not the company that is certainly the way of wild remembrance. It isn't that um, and I, I'm trying to say this in the most respectful fashion I can but I I don't believe that it's there's oh, let me back up a second we could find no licensure in the state of Michigan nor could we find any licensure Ms. Tuco in the state of North Carolina where she now resides. Um, there was then the issue of the um, biodynamic cranial socratic therapy. And we found in part because of what was sent to us um, regarding that therapy and also the testimony of um, the victim in this case, we found their accreditation page and searched for basically three different individuals. First of all, the individual um, who sent the letter that's the February 20, 2022 letter uh, vouching for the credentials of uh, Ms. Tuco. Search for that individual and um, which is basically, and we found that individual um, as being a member of that association. Then search for Ms. Tuco as well as the parents 
and neither come up either under a um, search of North America or the United States, I should say, and, and or on the search internationally. They don't come up. Um, which leads this court, given the evidence that's before it, to question those, the credentials to engage or have some therapy which would be related to this case. Um, and I, I'm worried, well, I'm not worried. I, I make the specific finding that a, I'm not sure that this is even a business. I can't find the way a wild remembrance registered as anything. Um, and, but the court received as exhibit three, the invoices of um, the way of wild remembrance, Ms. Tuco's company or assumed name, whatever it is. And as for uh, during the testimony, proof of payment. Now, I will say that proof of payment it was testified to said it was paid through PayPal. Um, ultimately, I was provided look like payments, but they're not through PayPal at all. They're through Cash App. And <sighs> There are a series of them. And so I took those receipts or those payments and matched them to the invoices. What's clear to me in this, and I will make the specific finding, is, is that these invoices I don't think existed prior to or at the time of the payment. The reason I say that is because they don't the payments and the invoices don't match up they're not some of them are not necessarily all that close if payment was made when services were rendered um, and i'm going to start at the, the end but then come back to the beginning but i received a june 23rd um, payment to Ms. Tuco. Um, and there's no invoice for June 23rd. And the court is not going to then consider because I don't even have an invoice for that payment. Um, but then when I go through, and now I'm going to go back to the beginning, when I there was a payment made by um, Ms. Morley of $90 on February 5th. That matches the February 5th invoice. Um, and so that date matches. Go to the next invoice, which was February 18th. And one ought to pay very close attention to this because then the invoice says it was submitted on the 19th. Now, I guess theoretically that kind of thing could happen maybe, but the problem with that is, is that if the invoice is on the 19th, that means Ms. Morley would have made a payment prior to receiving the services. Typically not how that happens. Um, and I would note just parenthetically that the, uh, the invoices from Great Lake Psychology all match when the payment was made, says when the payments were made, um, looks much like those receipts that one would receive at a doctor. But going back then to the, so the April, the 18th one, um, Kind of matches, but she would have made it before then. Um, 
Well, there's then a payment made by Miss Morley on March 3rd. And again, that would have been a payment made prior to the invoice. And the invoice is March 5th. So again, I don't believe it happened that way. I don't believe that she paid before um, that happened, which leads me to some doubt as to these records that are being supplied to the court. And I don't mean that by counsel supplying them to the court, but the ones that were presented to counsel to give to the court. There is then a March 14th, the March 14th one, I believe matches, if I'm not mistaken. The March, yes, the March 14th one. Here we go. There's March then 24th. And yeah, I one page. The March 24th one also does not match because the payment would have occurred prior to the invoice day. Again, it's not something that would happen. Then the remainder of those for April 1st payment and for the um, I think it's June 9th payment, those match the exact day. So the conclusion that the court comes to in terms of looking at those invoices and looking through all of this closely, trying to find Ms. Tucko, trying to see if she has any type of certification for any therapy, listening to Ms. Morley testify about how she came into contact with her. Um, I don't think this has anything to do with the events or is directly related in any way whatsoever to the events of September 22nd. Um, I do not, and I will say that these documents submitted to the court regarding this, the put it in quotes, therapy that Ms. Morley received um, is of dubious nature and quality in this court's mind. And the court is not going to award um, any restitution for those particular items um, with regard to Ms. Tupo. Um, again, specifically, the court would find that it's not directly related to the um, the incident um, which we're here for from September of 2023. Getting then to the and and let me just before I leave the two go and let me just also say that the letter that was sent. The information contained within, I don't think Ms. Tupco can make the diagnosis that she's making um, in this. I don't, I just don't see how she could with any representation, assuming this to have actually come from her because I, I don't have letterhead. I don't have anything from what presumably is a therapist association. Ne or, therapy, business involved in therapy. Going to the Great Lakes psychology, I don't at all have the problems that I had with um, Ms. Chuko's business. Um, but the letter that was sent, the May 1st letter um, that was sent, and the court's going to quote a specific portion of that letter, which is the second paragraph. And it says, during her September 24th session, Ms. Morley disclosed the assault that had taken place by her employer and further shared the nature of their relationship. The primary focus since the event that occurred has been placed on addressing the trauma that has surrounded the relationship in addition to addressing symptoms related to PTSD. That tells me 
is that the only therapy that was related directly related to the events of September 22nd was the therapy that occurred on the 24th of September. Because specifically, uh, Ms. Kalinsky, Kalinsky clearly indicates that the rest of the time was about the relationship and symptoms related to PTSD from other events and processes and talks about the concerns about her work environment and the impact that it was having on her mental health. Unrelated to those events in this court's mind. Also so that the record's clear and it's very clear the testimony in court has considered it, therapy began prior to the September 22nd day. So the there was therapy with great legs on the 13th of September and then again on the 24th and then there were therapy afterwards this letter doesn't indicate that they dealt with the events or the actions of the defendant as it relates to this charge any time after the 24th um, when the event was relayed to uh, Great Lakes. And so therefore, with reference to that, um, the restitution request on that, the court is only going to award the restitution for therapy for that one date. That's the only date, again, that is directly related to the events that the defendant uh, participated in. I have no other proof that any time after that, that anything happened. So in sum in total, and for those reasons, the court would and will order restitution in the amount of $147.38. Now, with reference to the, and there were really three issues. That's the one issue regarding the restitution, which is going to take most of our time. There is then the issue regarding the violation. The, and I was going to take it into account in sentencing, but I think I, the court needs to make it clear what the court's going to do with that. And I'm a bit dismayed. I, mean, I, I can only just put it that way. Dismayed, maybe a little bit um, angry in, in a certain respect. Um, Mr. Stevens properly admitted to the violation um, regarding that contact because he wrote something on an envelope. The regarding mail that he had received that he believed should have gone to Miss Morrill. It was relayed that, and so there, technically because he wrote that, there was indeed this violation. Um, Miss Morley, as she relayed it to probation and otherwise, was indicating that Mr. Stevens was trying to sort of tell her what to do or was making some threat. So at the last hearing, the only portion of the envelope we had was the one half of the envelope. Counsel for defendant had indicated that there was a credit card which was in that envelope. I didn't, couldn't see the full envelope, so I didn't know, but I know that there was credit card coming. It was likely going to either be a blank envelope or it was going to say very little about the fact that it was a credit card that was in.
when I saw the full envelope, it's very clear that there was a credit card that was finally admitted. It was also very clear that to this court that the defendant wasn't attempting by any means to try to direct Ms. Morley or any money or anything else along those lines or threaten her in any way. The only thing he was saying is, this is addressed to you. I'm giving it to you. I hope you do the right thing with this. If it had been a company credit card, which I believe that it was, if it was a company credit card, it's his company. He, quite frankly, could have opened it and said I opened it because I knew it was a company credit card and she wasn't supposed to have it at that point. But that's not what he did. And to be honest with you, I think he attempted to try to do the right thing. What I'm angry about is the representation made to this court, my probation department and everyone else, that he was attempting to make a threat or in some way intimidate Ms. Morley. Absolutely not. That is not what happened. Everything the defendant represented to this court regarding that envelope, that violation, turned out to be absolutely true the moment I asked for that full envelope. The court could verify. So therefore, while the defendant has admitted to that violation, I am vacating his admission to that violation. I am not sentencing on the violation. Because while there was a technical violation, I don't believe that that violation was meant to do anything. He was just trying to do the right thing. So I'm setting aside that admission. And I'm doing nothing further with this alleged violation. Ms. Malenka, you have said that you have uh, reviewed the report. There are no material deletions, corrections, or additions to that report. Is there anything you or your client would like to say before the court does it? I'm going to ask the court to follow the recommendation. Thank you. Sir, is there anything you want to say before I impose sentence? Thank you. So sent to the court. I'm going to place you on 18 months prosecutor deferred sentence. You're to pay $555 fines and court costs, $540 probation, oversight fees, $147, and I think 38 cents is what I said, restitution payable to Cashmere Morley, payable through the court. When can you pay that, sir? Pay that today. The restitution would be need to pay be paid in cash at the counter, however. Okay. Everything else could be paid in cash. That's to be paid today. There's to be no use of alcohol, recreational marijuana, or any illegal substance. You'll be subject to random testing as directed by probation. You are to complete a domestic violence program as directed by probation. There is to be no contact with Kashmir Morley, directly or indirectly. There is to be no assault or threatening or intimidating behavior. You are not to possess any weapons, firearms, ammunition, or anything fashioned to be a weapon. I'll set a review hearing on this matter. That is to be held September 16, 2024 at 1 p.m. I will order 93 days in jail. Credit for served balance suspended. Thank you. Thank you.